<laughs> awesome. And so this is my first B sites talk. I'm very happy to share it with you all today. I think it's going to be great. Uh, this is Fight Obituary, the Debt of Passwords. Uh, so who am I? My name is Brendan Burke. Everyone just calls me B. I work as a stock analyst for US custodian bank State Street. Uh, I'm a big fan of Linux, BSD, anything open source or Libra related, and I dabble in cryptography. Um, our agenda is pretty simple. I'm going to talk for about 30 35 minutes and try not to bore you. There will be time for QA at the end, so if you have questions, please ask them there. Let's get right into it. Authentication. So we have three main types of factors, and you likely already know them. We have knowledge factors. This is something that you know. These include your usernames, your IDs, your passwords, your pins, pretty basic stuff. We have possession factors. This is something that you have. Think of your OTPs, your Microsoft Authenticator, your key fobs to get into a building. This is something a user must have in their possession to be able to authenticate. And then we have inherence factors. This is something that you are. A retina or an iris scan, fingerprint scans, face and voice recognition, any biological traits a user has that we can use to authenticate with. And so we're gonna talk about some authentication history, just to set the scene. And so once upon a time, we just had dumb terminals and these would connect to an actual computer. This would either be in the next room or you would use a teletype to talk to something miles and miles and miles away. And our cryptography at the time wasn't superb, often non-existent, uh, because cryptography costs clock cycles and those were really, really valuable. So we used to just store passwords as plain text. And there's some obvious issues here. Students could work out what was on the upcoming test, see each other's homework, all that good stuff. So we got smarter most of the time. And Crypt was invented for Unix systems in 1973 by Robert Morris Sr. working for the NSA. Uh, you might know his son Robert Morris Jr. from the Morris War. Uh, Crypt was great for authenticating locally, but then we went and we invented the internet and we started authenticating users remotely. So we're now sharing secrets across the wire to authenticate what could possibly go wrong. for the uh, lack of HDMI audio, but hopefully you got the message. And so it turns out a lot can go wrong when you start sharing secrets to authenticate over the internet. Uh, let's have a quick look and see where it can break down. Uh, so this is a fairly standard, I'm going to stand back, this is a fairly standard uh, login flow. That's not right there. Ah, sorry. Okay, this is a fairly standard login flow that you're probably all familiar with, or I'm going to assume some familiarity. The user registers, they create an account, and then at some point, uh, they log into that account. And we hope this connection between the user and the server is over HTTPS. We hope the user has created a good password. We have to remember that even if the connection is end-to-end -end encrypted, at some point, the server will need that password in plain text in order to salt it, hash it, etc. And that's why we call it a shared secret. We hope that the server is taking the password, salting it and hashing it appropriately with something like Argon2, bcrypt or script. Uh, we hope they're using a secret salt and pepper, that all the private information is properly encrypted. And if they use something like SHA, did they at least key stretch to make it more difficult if those passwords are breached? And there's just an awful lot to try and juggle. Cryptography is hard, uh, and users are a lot harder. Let's do it that way. There we go. Uh, cryptography is hard, and users are a lot harder. And so you're probably all aware of most of what I covered, and even if you aren't, you use passwords yourself all day, every day. And so I want you all to think about the worst thing about passwords. Uh, the next slide's a little bit busy, and I'll read it out for the people at the back so they know. Um, but think about the worst thing about passwords. And then if I got it, or I'm in the right ballpark, give me a little bit of wiggle room, I want you to raise your hands. Uh, we have password managers are hard. Just use sticky notes, put them in Excel. And our password reuse, credential stuffing, weaker bad passwords, the rocky text file, bad complexity rules, max password length. Why do we have max password length? 
For its expire, see they just add a one or an exclamation mark every single time, or like 23. 2FA, MFA, badly implemented, we sim swapping, we've MFA fatigue attacks, and then everything that can and does go wrong, server side. So, if you thought any one of those are, as I said, in the right enough ballpark, you're completely wrong. Um, <laughs> now don't misunderstand. All of these things are bad, but they are not the worst thing about passwords. They are failings of our shared secret system, but they are not the absolute worst thing. The worst thing about passwords and authentication is that security professionals keep getting it wrong. Um, bit of a bold statement, what exactly do I mean by that? I fundamentally believe that every single good idea can be broken down into a comic strip. And if your good idea can't be boiled down to a comic strip, you need to break it up into smaller, better ideas. For those of you who haven't seen this, this is uh, XKCD 936, or more commonly known as Correct Force Battery Staple. XKCD makes the point that through 20 years of effort, we've successfully trained everyone to use passwords that are hard for humans to remember, but easy for computers to guess. And we have two things going on here. We have the computer aspect and we have the human aspect. Our password policies have ignored the human aspect and led to people using passwords that are easy to guess. Uh, if you search for this, you will find a Stack Overflow question and the top rated answer is by a user called Avid. Uh, he has a maxim, Avid's rule of usability. Security at the expense of usability comes at the expense of security. I want you to note that the passphrase correct horse battery staple, while having greater entropy than the password troubadour, would fail most modern password creation uh, due to complexity rules. These rules have led to more insecure user behaviours, and so much so that NIST updated their recommendations earlier this year on password complexity, and they've stated complexity requirements, like requiring special characters, numbers, or uppercase letters, should not be used. So what makes a password good is not that it is complex, or that it is long, but that it has high entropy. And very few of those creation things are measuring entropy. So, is there an answer to all this? Is there a solution? Is there, you know, did anyone sit down and think about this problem? And the answer is yes, otherwise it would be a, a very short talk. Um, so what is FIDO? FIDO stands for Fast Identity Online. FIDO Alliance is publicly launched in 2013. They are an open industry association with the goal of creating an open, global authentication standard based on public key cryptography. One of the main driving goals behind FIDO is to replace passwords, and this means competing with passwords across three main dimensions. We have speed. They should be faster than creating or using a password. There is convenience. They should be at least equally as convenient, if not more convenient, than using a password. And very finally, we have security. They should be phishing resistant and should be guaranteed to be unique per app, website, or service. So in December 14, they managed to launch their first two specifications, U2F and UAF. U2F stands for Universal Septicon Factor, and UAF stands for Universal Authentication Framework. Uh, UAF enables passwordless authentication via med local to the user's device, via gesture, a voice, or a pin. And U2F enables the use of a hardware token or another device, but only as a second factor, so we still need that primary factor, like a password, to be able to log in. Um, these are two interesting protocols, but there was a lot of room for improvement. Uh, U2F only worked as a second factor, as I said, and UAF uh, is a passwordless protocol, uh, but for mobile devices only, so that was another limiting thing. So we went back to the drawing board, and in April 2018, FIDO 2 specifications were launched, and these included WebAuthn and CTAP2, and we're mainly going to focus on these for the talk, and we're not going to worry about the older ones. Um, WebAuthn is a World Wide Web Consortium recommendation for defining an API, um, enabling the creation and use of strong, attested, scoped, public key-based credentials for web applications for the purpose of strongly authenticating users. I'll cover all those terms shortly, so don't worry if it's sailed over your head. WebAuthn is now built into practically every modern web browser, uh, so from a developer point of view, authentication becomes a whole lot simpler. There's numerous libraries for communicating with the WebAuthn API, um, and then we have CTAP for actually talking to the authenticator. CTAP2 is exactly as the name suggests, client to authenticator protocol, does what it says. 
Um, U2F was retroactively called CTOP1 since it features a lot of similarities, so that can be a little confusing. But as I said, we're not going to worry about the older ones. Uh, CTOP is implemented by the OS, so yet again, this is for Windows, Apple, Android, Linux devs, and anyone on the web server side, we don't have to worry about it. And so that was a lot of slides, a lot of information. Uh, time to do a live demo. Here we go. And try and do this. Yes. So, uh, for this uh, demo, I'm going to use liveauthn.me. It's a really great site to mess around with Fido2 authentication. Um, I'm going to register a user, um, and I'm going to use my Fido2 key here. I know you can't see it, but light is green, working. There we go. Please. <laughs> well, this is a lot So it's asking me for a pin and to be able to interact with my authenticator. Uh, so I'm going to give it that pin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the dangers of doing live demos. <laughs> No internet connection? Oh, Wi-Fi? Yeah. Same. Uh, I'll try another one. All right, off. All right, let's on. Connection. This one. A seven eight. Hey, this is Cooper. Sorry for the interruption here, but on the day we were unable to make a recording of Brandon's laptop. So as a result, this live demo could not be recorded. However, Brandon had made a recording of the things he has done during this live demo. And I will be including that here along with the audio for that recording. Because try as he might, the recording was not identical to what he was doing on stage. So I expect the audio to sound a bit different at this stage. Once the demo is over, we will cut back to the original video and resume the talk. So for this demo, I'm going to use uh, webauthn.me, which is a really great site for playing around with uh, FIDO2 authentication. Um, I'm going to start with registering a user. So we are going to be B sides Belfast 23. And I'm going to register. And now I get a, a challenge on my authenticator. And before we can access the authenticator, we're going to input a pin. So there's my six digit pin and now i have to touch the authenticator the light has gone uh, from green to orange so i press the button and just like that we've registered a uh, a new credential so what actually happened there let's dive in if we go to this information page uh, we can see a bunch of uh, really great diagrams uh, i've opened those up here um in kind of a higher um uh, zoom so um we have kind of three main parties we have the uh the client and user agent this is us in our, our browser 
We have the relying party, which is Fido speak for, you know, Amazon, Google, GitHub, um, whatever web server it is that we're trying to authenticate with. And then we have our authenticator, and this can be either a platform or a cross-platform authenticator. Uh, I'm obviously using a, a cross-platform, the USB key, but this could just as easily be a platform authenticator, such as the fingerprint reader in your smartphone. And then we have this interaction here, which is when I, uh, I interacted, I had to press the button to confirm that uh, I was there, but this is not always necessary. So, when we talk about FIDO2, we have two main uh, ceremonies. We have registration and we have authentication or the login. So for registration, uh, we go to the relying party and they give us you know, the option to register. So when we, uh, we click that button, uh, we ask them for a challenge and they will send us a challenge. Um, now this challenge is just a really long random string uh, that is used to prevent replay attacks. Now at this point, before we talk to the authenticator, the WebAuthn API in the browser will check if the origin in the browser matches the relying party ID that was sent to us. So let's imagine that you know we were phished and we were actually at uh, Google with two zeros instead of Google, the, uh, the genuine domain. Um, at this point, we would reject the challenge and the user isn't registered. So any type of man in the middle or similar attacks, those, uh, those are not a possibility here. Um, assuming that that is valid, uh, we send it to the authenticator. So we get the relying party ID, the origin, the user ID, a bunch of various options, and then that challenge string. So the WebAuthn API in the browser talks to the authenticator over CTAP2, and it sends all this stuff over. Now, we create a brand new public-private key pair, and we create a credential ID. We store the private key with the relying party ID and credential ID, and this private key never leaves the authenticator. We build and sign a response, but we do not sign it with the private key that we just generated. The relying party doesn't know anything about the key pair we just generated, so it's no good just yet. So we use the attestation private key. Um, attestation private keys are burned into the device and they're not unique to the device. The terms attestation and assertion are very frequently confused. Attestation occurs during registration, which is this ceremony here, and assertion occurs uh, when authenticating. So. We sign the challenge uh, with the burn-in attestation key, and then we send the challenge back to the relying party. Uh, when this challenge reaches the relying party, they can verify the origin. So they do the same check that we did. You know, who does the browser think they are talking to? Who is the actual domain of the relying party? They can verify the challenge. They're going to make sure that no replay attacks have taken place and that it is the same challenge that they sent us. They can verify the attestation signature if they want to. And if they uh, want to verify that, they can um, uh, use the FIDO metadata service to check which authenticator signed this and uh, is, it a, is it a known model. And they can also verify this the whole way up to the root trust, the same way that we would verify an X509 uh, certificate with our standard um, uh, search in a browser. Assuming that all of those things pass and the relying party is happy, uh, they will store the user ID, the credential ID, and the public key that we sent over. And then, you know, we're registered, we're done. Now we can register multiple authenticators on an account uh, for recovery. So for example, if we lost our uh, platform authenticator, our USB key, uh, we could get back in with our phone or with our second authenticator. And this is of course recommended uh, just in case the worst should happen. So we've completed the first uh, ceremony, we've completed the registration. Now we're going to perform the second ceremony, which is authentication. So for authentication, this is uh, really, really simple. I'm going to click login and the browser talks to relying party, relying party talks to the browser, 
browser talks to my authenticator. Again, before the WebAuthn API can talk to my authenticator over CTAP, I have to give it a pin. Uh, this can be uh, reasonably long as well. You could have like a password style pin. I'm going to press enter. I'm going to, again, uh, get a time down, press the button on my authenticator. And just like that, I've successfully logged in. So just as convenient and fast, uh, if not uh, definitely more so than, than a password. Um, so what actually happened there? Let's, let's dive into it. Um, much like the registrations party, we uh, registration ceremony, excuse me, we talk to the relying party um, and they will send us a challenge that we have to sign. Um, this message will also have the relying party ID and the credential ID we created, uh, assuming we're going with a username and we're not doing username uh, authentication. Um, if we have resident keys, what we will do is we will use the relying party ID to identify the public key on the authenticator and we will have a passwordless uh, username-less login. Um, we again, at this point, check that the relying party ID uh, that they sent us and the origin that the browser is seeing is one the same. No man in the middle, no proxying traffic, nothing like that is allowed. Um, if that passes, we then send that over uh, to the authenticator. And again, this uh, kind of authorization, this is optional. We have a uh, user pr presence or user verification. User presence is just a gesture, uh, pressing a button or, or similar. And user verification is uh, like the pin. It's verifying that the user is actually authorized to use that authenticator. So we have multi-factor in the one. Um, we retrieve the private key um, that is associated with the credential ID, and we verify it was created for that relying party ID. We build and we sign a response, and we send that back to the relying party. So when this challenge reaches the relying party, they once again do the same check. They verify the origin uh, in the browser and their domain, the relying party ID is one and the same. They verify that the challenge is the challenge that they sent. Remember, no replay attacks. They verify the credential ID that we sent along, that they, they know who that uh, uh, user is. They can identify them by the ID. And then they verify the signature with the public key that they have stored. And assuming that those four verifications pass, the relying party will say, yep, the user is authenticated and they will allow us to log in. When all of that has taken place, we retrieve the private key uh, associated with the credential. We verify that it was created by the relying party that we're speaking to. We build, sign the response, send it to the right party. Oh, wait. So, sign, send it back. And when this reaches the right party, they do the same thing we do. Verify origin. Verify the challenge. There's been no replay attack. Verify the credential ID. Verify the signature with public key. And this time we've signed it with the on-device private key, not the attestation private key. And if all of those pass, we're happy. The user has authenticated. Never do my demos again. Thanks, Bill. So what problems have we solved here? Um, why are people so excited about this new tech and uh, getting rid of kind of legacy authentication systems? And um, we're authenticating with very secure, battle-tested, well-known public key cryptography. And um, what about that looming quantum crypto apocalypse that's going to happen? Well, just last month, um, Google announced the world's first quantum resilient 502 secure key implementation as part of, uh, of OpenSK. Um, likely you'll have a lot of other companies following the suit and developers uh, doing the same kind of thing. So um, we're not too worried. We're getting ahead before uh, before it kind of uh, all kicks off. Um, we have unique public keys and private key pairs for, for every login. 
And those private keys are typically massive 256 and the public ones are 1496. So you're, you're talking reasonable, reasonable, uh, key size. Um, this whole system means we have no phishing, right? Because how does a user give away something that they don't know? You call someone up and say, hey, what's your password? I don't know, I just press the button. Um, all of that stuff goes away. One time passes uh, go away. Um, breaching the relying party on the server side would only leave you with the public keys and this is not enough to perform an authentication. Um, because the user is the one who initiates the login, right? And they must have the authenticator in their possession. Um, so no phishing, no cred stuffing, no man in the middle, all of that is done. Do we get any privacy? Um, that depends. We can use the file metadata service if we want to, um, but we don't have to. You can, as a relying party, say, hey, I don't actually care what you're using for your authenticator. I don't care if it's made by Ubico. I don't care if you're using a smartphone. I don't, it's not a problem to me. Um, so that's definitely an option. And then we have this question of do we really need to know who the user is? With Fido 2, it's possible to do user nameless logins. Sounds really, really strange. So you don't even need to attach any kind of username. You can just use that credential ID, which is a 64 uh, bit number. So 2 to the 64. If you're ever expecting more than 2 to the 64 users on your website, you know, good for you. Super popular. Um, so. Really, it'll depend on what you're trying to do. Maybe you have cases like banking where you've uh, KYC, you know, your customer AML, anti-money laundering. You will need to strongly verify who that user is. You will need to know who they are. You can't go user nameless. And um, so this is really interesting about FIDO because it's like the framework can be as restrictive or as permissive as you choose. And um, what other problems did we solve? Um, I spent a lot of time searching for the amount of times users spent typing passwords, found numerous figures. The low ball was 16 and the high ball was 27 hours a year. And um, personally, I love to have 27 hours of my life back every year. Uh, those stack and I'm not getting any younger. Um, in terms of MFA codes, there was even less data, but the time fell to around half that. So you're talking eight to 13 and a half hours every single year. Add those up and you have 24 to 40 and a half hours for every employee every year. And then you have all the time of cybersecurity and help desk teams either investigating MFA failures, password sprays, resetting passwords, yada, 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 yada. We're all sick of it. Um, and we have to remember that time is money. None of these teams are working for free. And um, according to the FIDO Alliance, your average help desk labor cost for a single password is about $70. Passwords are the root cause of over 80% of data breaches. More than 50% of passwords are reused. Um, and so making the short term, the change to password list, it's really, it's not cheap in the short term. Um, but if you consider it against kind of the budget savings or just cost of a data breach, God forbid, um, it doesn't sound like such a poor investment. So where do we go from here? Um, well, you can learn more and get up to speed with all this uh, FIDO stuff and it kind of depends on what kind of field you're in, I suppose. If you're management or strategic leaders and you go to the FIDO Alliance um, uh, website, they have a bunch of blog posts about people who have already made the move, the pitfalls that they've hit, the things that they've gotten wrong, and so really, really valuable there. And um, if you're a sysadmin and you're using Azure AD today, you're just all in cloud, congratulations. You can go full passwordless. It's really, really easy. And Microsoft have a bunch of documentation on that. And um, if you have on-prem and the latest KC connector, there is a kind of hack way around where you can send a request to Azure AD first and then back into your own on-prem. Uh, so that is a possibility too. Um, if you're a dev or software developer, uh, Google have loads of fantastic documentation. They have a uh, build your first FIDO app uh, playground. So in about uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you can have a web off end uh, app spun up and, and running. It's a lot of fun. And um, Ubico have lots of great dev docs. They also provide the main Linux library, FIDO2 uh, lib. And then if you're in cybersecurity, you can level up your skills and uh, start being more secure. It's uh, really, really worth it. Um, the web off end. 
website when you do have a Wi-Fi connection and you're not under mad pressure. It's great. A lot of fun to play around it. Um, so, do I actually think that passwords are dead? Um, I think we're going to see another two decades of bad passwords. Um, if you search for the string, you know, debt of passwords, you find um, stuff from 2004 where the likes of Bill Gates and some senior Google engineers said, oh, the password is dead, the debt of passwords. And we're here in 2024, 20 years later. Um, it has taken a while for us to get the technology off the ground. And let's remember that 502 really only launched in 2018, and it's one thing to have standards, it's quite another to get them implemented, get the libraries, get them widely adopted, accepted, and ultimately trusted by people. And maybe a bit anticlimactic to end on the note that passwords are not dead and not going anywhere. And, but yeah, they're a bit like the undead, they won't stay dead. <laughs> Uh, but we do have the tools to survive the night, and hopefully we get to see a brighter dawn. Um, ten points to everyone who got my Romero zombie references. I'm very sorry for making those jokes. Uh, you've been an absolutely wonderful audience. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to take some questions. There's a there's a prize for best question, I should say. Yes. A dumb question. Could you work in a uh, sort of bank? Have they moved out to using Fiverr yet? Um, I'm not going to make any comments about my employer. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> not a liberty to say. Nice try, though. <laughs> any other questions? Yes, sir. So, if you are using a Fido device, yes, the private key is turned onto the device. The attestation private key is yes. Um, where are those stored and is there a risk of the vendor being compromised will compromise the integrity of your file uh, key? Um, yeah, good question actually. So what we have, that association key is kind of burned in. Um, so there's, there's a couple of different parts to that question. Um, most of these chips are kind of secure, tamper-proof chips. They're designed for you to not be able to get keys off them or not be able to do it easily. There has been one case of such where a bunch of researchers in the Netherlands hacked a, a key by uh, Titan. The actual chip by, was by NXP Semiconductors. And they managed to retrieve the keys after three, four weeks of slamming it with a couple of NVIDIA GPUs. It was not a cheap attack. When they succeeded, they got, you know, one public private key pair for one account. So is it feasible now? Probably not. Those chips have been fixed by AXP. And um, because you have the private keys on the device and they never leave the device, if you breach the relying party on the other side, you get the public key. But that's all that you have. You can't go and do a password spray, you can't do any credential stuffing, you can't use that public key in any meaningful way. You need the user to initiate the logon. It's from the user side. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Close enough. Awesome. It's yeah, so, yeah, so what happens when you lose the key and also the backup key? Um, yeah, good question. Um, we, you know, you want to have two keys or three keys if you log into the accounts, you can set up um, multiple keys. I said that the private keys never leave the device and that's a little bit of a lie. So if you have um, Google, you're on Google, you're on Apple, or you're on Microsoft, there is a way to back up your keys. They get a, a kind of like an encrypted blob. Each company does it a little bit differently. Apple has their secure keychain, so your stuff gets backed up there. And then if you want to access those in your MacBook, or let's say you lose every Apple device, provided you can get into your Apple account, you can get those keys. Now, is that a single point of failure? Yeah, it is. But for the average user, is it still better than using passwords? Absolutely, it is. And, and that convenience, I would say, make the trade-off. Uh, this is, you saw me, it's just press a button, you know, this is something your grandmother can use, maybe set it up for her. And, but yeah, yeah, if you, if you lose your recovery key, you are bummed. In the same way of like, can you get a reset? Um, probably not. The specification doesn't allow for it, so we can't just send you a reset to your email. Does that answer your question? Yep. No, thank you. No problem. Uh, from a dev perspective, is there any like additional 
necessary and so considerations you have to make in order to want to implement that whole plan. I right. suppose just the standard password DB. Yeah, yeah, good question. And so in terms of how you store it in the database, uh, not really. You just, you store the public key, you store the credential ID, but in, in like your database columns, everything is just, it's, it's the same. You're storing it that way. In the, how you communicate with the uh, API, that is in the browser. And there's a bunch of different libraries depending on whether you're Ruby on Rails, raw PHP, whatever you're, you're working with, and um, there's, I think, more than 15 very, very good, very well tested libraries for that. And so that's pretty much all you have to implement as a dev, right? You now don't have to worry about hashing, salting, none of this stuff. You store the public key, you let the browser deal with it, you let the OS devs deal with the CTAP and talking to the authenticator, there's less work for you to do. Uh, what about with the, um, I forgot the name of like, the middle server, the rep? The replying party? Uh, the relying party? Yes. Uh, it, can you, that's something you said yourself, or is that like what we stand? Sorry, yeah, no, I, I should have made it clear. So the relying party is the server you're authenticating against. So yeah. like in this case, Facebook, yeah. Google, whoever it is, and they are the relying party. Is that, yeah, covers Awesome. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So the resident keys are divided through all the stores on the hardware token, and all stores medium is going to Time. Yes. Um, it's a bit like our modern SSDs, like, yes, it's going to expire, but five, ten years, you're, you've a reasonable length of time. It's not like, it's not anything that I'd be seriously worried about. Um, how many times have you had a USB key go pop? Yeah, it's less than that. So. And again, if you're if you're on Apple, Microsoft, Google, any of those, you have those backups there, and that is that is an option. And you're trading a certain amount of security for usability, for convenience. And I would say in most use cases, it's probably worth it. And not in every account. Some stuff you you just want two hardware keys, and you want to be really secure, and you want to be really safe. And for other stuff, you're probably not as concerned. So yeah. It's probably worth back up the key. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. So you talk a lot about the, the kind of businesses that adopted using the opportunity key for the library mm. and also for, for security purposes. Um, like it took me a week to convince my parents to use multi-factor. <laughs> yeah. Do, yeah. Do, you, do you see any sort of public push on the, like maybe like bio and pass keys and such being used, but a push for the public to use pass keys or more? Why do in general like this and all together? Um, as I said, I, I, I don't think that passwords are dead. I think it's going to be another 20 years of passwords. And they're going to be a bit like Telnet or Windows 2008 servers. You're just going to pop up in lots of weird places where we don't want to see them. They're just a nuisance. Um, but they're going to be there. And um, people are going to be using knowledge based strings for authentication for a long time yet. Um, should you, you know, buy your folks a final key for Christmas? Maybe not immediately, but it starts with having the conversation or just showing them, hey, look, I got this cool new thing and press button, I can log in. And um, so, yeah, yeah. It, um, I, I, I do think it will go that way. I think we've seen enough um, hacks, particularly even like the MGM or these other things where our MFA solutions have not worked. They are not sustainable long term. And um, the idea of you know using a time based code is just fundamentally flawed. Uh, if you're using HOTP and you're using like a, a, a hash base, it's a little bit better. If you're IV and you've a certain you've more randomness than what you're taking from a clock. And um, but ultimately MFA is just eh, we've seen it fall flat enough, I think, the data speaks for itself. So that answer your question a little bit rambling, so. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Is there any way to, other than adding new, <laughs> new place to your account, is there any way to migrate between, let's say, if you have something so it does not the same, or anyone who can actually buy the feed? Hmm. It's the only option, you know, if you have air 15 methods of everyone up to log in. Individually, every single one, yeah. 
yeah, there's no, this is it, the private keys are immutable, they don't leave the device, you're going to have to go in and create a new public private key pair for every single one. They're non-transferable, and that's, that's the beauty of that whole notion of scope, right? Even if somebody got one private key, public key pair, and they can get it off the device, it's for one account. You're locked into that one relying party thing, um, which is great. You get an individual secure login for everything, but there is a certain amount of yeah, trade-off. Now, you don't uh, have any expiry. They never expire. You don't need to renew them. You don't need to you know, plug it in and press button. So all those costs of like password renewals every single you know, three months, whatever, that's gone. So you do only have to set it up once, I guess. You never have to worry about expiring. Am I over? We're just on time. Okay. Cool, We're just on time. Awesome. And whoever asked me the question about the uh, Fido keys being uh, a good Christmas present, yes, sir. Congratulations. Okay. Come on up.